Good evening to everyone. I'm grateful for the blessing of the Lord and we're happy to be sharing with you again for Bible study. And we thank God for all of you all who are joining. I see that there are a lot of all who are joining on Zoom. God bless uh, Missionary Francis Green and I know Sister Diane Washington is on it. Some of these other numbers, because you won't put your name up, I don't know you, who you are, but we're grateful for you and then those of you who are joining us through uh, Facebook, let us know that you're there. I see Sister Sandra Ross and Sister Beatrice Spruill. So glad for you all. We hope that others will be joining us momentarily. That's Alicia Love, we're grateful for you. Let's, let's have a moment of prayer and then we're gonna get uh, started with our Bible study for, for this evening. Dear God in heaven, again, we thank you and we praise you for all things. We thank you, God, for this opportunity uh, to come together again for our prayer and Bible study. Lord, look upon your people now. For God, these are days that we really need your leading. We really need your help. Yes, God, God we, we come before the throne of grace this evening. And ask asking, oh God, for your mercy, oh God. We're asking, Lord, that you will help us through these difficult days, trying times. But then, Lord, we must also offer thanks to you because you've been so good. You've been so kind. We really don't need to, at any moment, complain about anything because yes. in this time of the pandemic and other troubles that we're experiencing, God, you have made a way. You have blessed us, Lord. You have provided for us. We thank you, God. We thank, thank you. you for your protection. Yes. Lord. We thank you for a provision. And we thank you, God, for how you have blessed our families and our loved ones and the church family, oh God. In this time, you have, have enabled us to be able to communicate with, with our church family. And we are thankful for that, God. God, we pray that you will bless us this evening and give us, Lord, an understanding of your word that we, Lord, would be a better people. Yes, that we be better workers in your kingdom, that, that Lord, that, that we be in a position where you can use us even the more, yes, that the kingdom be expanded, God, that souls will be saved, and people will be delivered. Yes, oh, God, help us now, God. We pray for your anointing, that you will anoint us, Lord, to do a work for you, that you will anoint us, Lord, that we will do things that you have designed us to do. We thank you. We bless your name, oh God. We praise you. We give you glory. We give you honor. The honor belongs to you. The glory is yours. God, I pray that you just have your way in our lives, that you will lead and direct us, that you will guide us, Lord. We need guidance, Lord. We, we, we need your direction, oh God. In the name of Jesus, there are families out here now, Lord, who, who have suffered um, the loss of loved ones and we pray, God, that you would help them and comfort their heart. Bless these families who are bereaved today, that you would touch, Lord, and that you would help them, Lord, in a difficult time. Lord, continue to guide us, continue to keep us. Bless us, oh God, even tonight for this time of Bible study. And God, we're just going to continue to give you the praise, going to continue to give you the glory and honor that you always deserve. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We thank God for each and every one of you. And I do want to um, say this to uh, the members of Lily the Valley. Um, you received a text about uh, missionary Levada Cole to, to pray for her. She lost her husband. And um, most of you are probably uh, are not familiar with uh, the Cole because they moved here during the pandemic. And um, mm -hmm. I think it was back in July. And when we would have our parking lot services, um, just about but most of the parking lot services through the summer, they were there. Of course, uh, being in our vehicles and so forth, we did not have the opportunity to uh, meet Superintendent Cole, but he was a wonderful man of God, a, a great gospel preacher. And so we want you to certainly pray uh, for the family of course, uh, Missionary Coles is a part of our family. This is the cousin of my wife. So we want you to pray for Missionary 
that the Lord will certainly uh, uplift her and give her the strength that is needed in these days. All right, tonight we're going to study um, a topic from the book of Revelation. I, I was blessed to be with uh, Pastor John Howard and the uh, St. Mark uh, Church of God in Christ there in Mumbai the last two the last uh, two uh, uh, Tuesday nights in their Bible study conversations in Revelation because I was on that particular subject and why I uh, tried to deal with the uh, this past this, uh, Tuesday night did not get a chance to finish that particular topic I thought it would be um, continue on tonight. And I think that you will enjoy this particular topic. I think you're going to get something out of it. I want to, uh, to my best ability, I want to try to uh, show you some things that are happening right now um, that will definitely uh, show that you, that we are in the last days. Let me, let me put this way. I got a little distracted with something I'm trying to do here real quick. But let me just say this, take the time to share uh, this uh, Bible study. That's what I'm doing, even on my page as I'm talking to you. Take the time to share this Bible study um, on Facebook so others can be a part of the Bible study on tonight. All right, our subject tonight coming out of Revelation chapter 17 is Mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon. And we're using the uh, verses, verses, one through seven, then we're going to go to 16 through 18. Oh, where my script just put up the, uh, okay, the, the uh, notes that I have, because we're going to look at these scriptures as we uh, begin to discuss this particular subject, uh, Mystery Babylon. The first question I have on the notes, and uh, there it is, she has it now for you to, or will be on momentarily for you that are, uh, that are with us tonight. Uh, First question I have, who or what is Mystery Babylon? Who or what is Mystery Babylon? The definition that I'm going to give you is that it is, it is spiritual Babylon, a religious system symbolized by a woman. Now, let me say this. There are two cities in the Bible uh, beginning in the book of Genesis, all the way to Revelation, you will see these two cities, and these two cities have been opposed to each other. What are the two cities? Babylon and Jerusalem. Babylon has its beginnings um, there in Genesis chapter 11 with the founder Nimrod. Of course, Jerusalem, the first time we really see something about Jerusalem is also in the book of Genesis. I thank you We'll find something about Drew. Let me see. Probably around Genesis, maybe about the 17th chapter. I may be off of chapter two, but you can remember when Abraham went and he uh, fought a war to save Lot, his nephew, because Lot was living in Sodom, as you remember. And uh, there were some kings, about four kings, in a battle against five kings. And uh, uh, Lot was in one of those cities that lost in that particular battle. So Abraham rescued him, but after the battle was over, he met a mysterious character by the name of Melchizedek. And the Bible lets us know that Melchizedek was both king and priest of Salem. Salem is another name for Jerusalem. So in the book of Genesis, you see the beginning of Babylon and Jerusalem. Babylon it is, has been called by theologians the city of Satan. Jerusalem is the city of God. Mm. All right? And they have opposed each other, and you can see the opposition clearly in the book, in the Old Testament books. Now, you don't see as much about Babylon opposing Jerusalem in the New Testament, but it did exist. It existed in the... Um, the uh, New Testament. And of course, you will see it again in the book of Revelation. Presently, uh, most of Babylon is in ruins. 
but that according to the scriptures, the scriptures let us know that it is a city that is going to emerge again because Babylon, the city of Babylon, is going to be one of the headquarters for the Antichrist himself. So this is why we refer to it as the city of Satan, but Jerusalem is the city of God. Now, this lesson tonight deals with mystery Babylon because in the 17th chapter of, of Revelation, it talks about mystery Babylon. Then it's also going to refer to the city of Babylon. Revelation chapter 18 goes into more details as to that city that's going to reemerge. But let's look again at Mr. Babylon. It is a religious system that is symbolized by a woman. Can I just give you a little history about the beginning? Because I just told you that, that it has its beginnings in the book of Genesis with the man by the name of Nimrod. Uh, Nimrod is the, oh, let me see. He is the great grandson, if I got in my mind correctly, of Noah. After the flood of Noah ends and the, the, the earth begins to populate again, uh, Nimrod uh, was able to uh, convince really a scene that just about all of the world at that present time to meet him uh, in the plains of, of Shinar. The city of Babylon is built because it wasn't called Babylon then. Or, well, let me, let me rephrase this. I said it wasn't called Babylon then. It wasn't called Babylon in, in, in the book of Genesis. But the word uh, Babel, that's Genesis chapter 10, and then Genesis chapter 11, uh, Babel, I think, is the Hebrew form for Babylon, which is Greek. So it's the same place. The founder of Babel or Babylon is Nimrod. Nimrod means rebel, and he's the one who built the city. But more importantly, he's the one who instituted the first organized rebellion against God himself, which is the beginning of idolatry. Look at what Genesis 10 and 9 says. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, that is King James Version, of course. Jimmy Swagger, in his commentary on the book of Genesis, he says that Nimrod was not a hunter of animals, as most people believe, uh, but that he actually uh, hunted people that he went out and he hunted people, particularly, and that Swagger believed, particularly he was hunting people who worshiped Jehovah because Nimrod as a rebel, he was actually teaching the people uh, to, to no longer worship the God of heaven. As a matter of fact, some historians in their writings said that Nimrod was, was, was really telling the folk uh, that it was God who had sent that blood. He blamed God for the flood. Now we know that God's, God did send the flood, but it was because of sin. It was punishment because of their wicked ways. But he's trying to cast a negative light, uh, light on God. And, and, and then he gets engaged in building this huge tower. You're going to see a picture of this in a few minutes. This huge tower uh, that supposedly, now you're not going to find what I'm saying right now in the Bible, but history says that uh, Nimrod was building silent, telling the people that, that if God sends another flood, we will be safe because we're mm -hmm. simply going to climb into this tower and God will not be able to um, drown us. Now, Nimrod, being the mighty person that he was, he tried his best to turn the people away from God Matter of fact, in that tower that's built in a spiral shape, you all know, you all have seen spiral staircases before. Uh, it was built in a spiral shape. So as you climb the tower, there were different shrines. As you climb up, you would see these shrines were built to idol gods. But ultimately, what Nimrod wanted was that the people worship him. Hmm. All right. He was, a, he was the world's first dictator. And he did all he could to pull the people away from God and to do what? To cause the people to worship him. Now, let me point this out because this is important for you to understand the mystery of Babylon. 
he was able to gather the folks in the plains of Shinar to really to unite the people. God's plan was that the people uh, repopulate the earth and that they would, uh, in repopulating the earth, that they would move to different parts of the earth. Nimrod tried to gather everybody together uh, that there'd be a united front. And his idea was to be united against God. And, and so what does God do? God steps into the picture. At this time, there was, there, was, there was one language that everybody spoke. Some theologians believe it was Hebrew. We don't know exactly. But one language. And the Bible said that he, that God confounded the languages. That, that means he, he uh, that, that afterward that became a mixture, different languages. Somebody started speaking Chinese, Japanese, mm -hmm. Greek, and Latin, English, and whatever. And not only did God do that, but God began to divide the people. Uh, it is believed by theologians as well as um, people who study, I'm trying to think of the correct word, not geographers, but linguists. Uh, no, not linguists, because what I want to say is this. Not, uh, well, let me just put it this way uh, that not only did God confound the languages, but it is at this point that God separated the seven continents. Okay. There are scriptures in the Bible, at least two scriptures, that show us before the days of, or during the days of Peleg that all of the earth actually uh the seven continents were united as one scientists and that's why i was trying to think of the correct term whatever branch of science is uh have have also uh through their scientific study have discovered that all seven continents were at one time united but this is when god divides the continents and this is how people got this. Uh, got scattered over here in North and South America when God did this. Plus, you have these new languages. So God steps in and he stops this one world government that was back in that particular day. Now, what's interesting about this is that uh, ever since the Tower of Babel was stopped, it, it, it was an incomplete tower. All right. Ever since that has occurred, man has been trying to go back to the idea of the Tower of Babel. Because notice what I have pulled up here in my notes. Now, man wants self-glory and to achieve a God status, which ultimately ends with the worship of Satan. Uh, it, it, well, you actually can go back before the Tower of Babel because in the Garden of Eden, when, when uh, the serpent uh, tempted Eve, you remember what, you remember what, what, what the serpent told him? Say, if you eat of this fruit, your eyes will be open. But he also told him, say, you will be as the gods, yes. knowing good and evil. Yes. Adam and Eve should have never known in, in one sense what evil was, all right? And, and really what's, what Satan was saying through the serpent, uh, your eyes will be open and you determine what's good and what's evil. I hope y'all got that. Because that's what man is trying to do today, rather than looking at what the Bible says in terms of what's good and evil. Man wants to set his standards, and man's standards can never be where God's standards are. And if we're going to please the, please the Lord, we must accept his standards, all right? But what I want you to look at is man is, has, is doing the same thing today. He's trying to become a God, and in doing that, it's gonna, it, all it's going to do is lead to the worship of Satan. So let's look at some symbols that are being used today. Uh, there is an organization that's over in Europe uh, that's called the European Union. I'm pretty sure that many of y'all have heard of this, this, this organization. It's been around for a number of years. I think it got started somewhere in the 1960s, maybe. Uh, we kind of refer to it as the EU. Now, now, the European Union, or let me say the continent of Europe, it, it's small in terms of a land mass but it has multiple countries. I, I should have looked up how many countries that are over there, but I think you, you, you have over 35 countries that, that are on the continent of, of Europe. It's, many of them are small. Um, some of those countries are as small as some of the states and states of America. But you have this organization, and in today's time, uh, there are about 27 countries that are part of this union. And what their, what their goal is, 
The goal is to unite all of Europe into one body, acting as a single nation with one ruling body. My wife just looked it up to, to let us know that there are 44 countries on the continent of Europe. 27 of those countries are part of the European Union or the EU. And again, the ideal is that they act as a single nation with one ruling party, one ruling body. You see, they look at the United States. We have 50 states plus some territories and we're one country. In order to compete against the United States economically, this was the idea years ago, if we unite and come up with a current, uh, a common currency and perhaps one day have uh, a common parliament, one body that make all the laws and relax our borders. Because right now, if you go over there, uh, uh, you don't have to have visas or passports to go from one country to the other because they relax the borders. It's, it's a, if we, we do all that, then we can compete against the United States. But what this is actually doing, this is actually leading to a one world government. Now, what you see on the screen right now is a picture, uh, a propaganda poster for the for the European Union. Look what you see on there. What you see are, I think, there are 12 stars at the top. And then that is a picture of, that someone drew of what the Tower of Babel may have looked like. Now, I want you to look at something else here. In the right-hand corner, you may notice it says Europe. Many times, one voice. Many times, one voice. Because you, you got all the different languages. That you have the Spanish language, English, Italian, you know. Uh, Greek that is spoken there. So many times with one voice, in other words, we all coming together to what? To unite. The idea is if we unite as one body, this can lead to the future of spread into other continents to unite as one power. All right. Now, the next picture that's on here, if we can go come up. Well, let me let me read this statement first before I go to the next question. This this 1992 poster was commissioned and widely circulated at great expense. Of course, the idea came from the Tower of Babylon. I think you can clearly see that from the picture. Here's another picture that's that's on the screen now. Okay. And and you can see that picture of the Tower of Babylon. That's another um artist conception that, that he drew to put on paper. So the, the when you go back to the, the first one, you're saying the, Euro, the European Union, this is one of their symbols on their poster. Yes, yeah. This, this first one with the stars, this mm -hmm. this is a propaganda thing to, to, to try to get, because you just told me when you looked at that 44 mm -hmm. European countries, 27 of them are actually in the Union, but they want to get the others yeah. to join in. And if you pay attention to the new Great Britain, which is one of the most powerful countries in the world, just left the European Union. Uh, so they, they definitely want to get them to come back in. But now, as we look at these two artists' conceptions, I want you to look at the European Parliament building. The Parliament uh, is a lawmaking body. And this, this uh, uh, Parliament here, supposedly are making, are going to attempt, and they have done so, um, uh, to a certain degree, uh, have made laws for those countries that are in the European um, Union. So this next picture is a building that's in Strasbourg, France. Now look at this building. This building here is a building. Let me read what's up there. And of course, I can. You don't have to go back and look on this one here. The, the European Parliament building in Strasbourg, France, appears to be modeled on the famous depictions of the Tower of Babel, even though they have denied that fact. This 60 meter high tower section of the complex added to the low rise offices cost 470 million euros. It was designed so as to appear, listen to this, uh, un unfinished on one side, allegedly facing eastward. And it's claimed that 
it, it is the symbolic of the EU not being complete until the Eastern Bloc countries join. So they left, listen, listen to this, they left that building uh, incomplete. All right, now they say because they have not gotten all of the uh, countries of Europe to join in, particularly those that are in the Eastern Bloc that are closer to Russia. But the real reason they left that building uh, incomplete is because it's modeled after, listen to what I'm saying, it is modeled after the uh, um, oh, Tower of Babel that we read about in the Bible. Now I'm going so with this, I want y'all to kind of stay with me because I'm setting this up for Revelation chapter 17. There was a uh, journalist that was, uh, that lived in that particular city, Strasbourg, France, that was asked the question, I don't have that information, I'm reading this off of a document, said, asked, the question was asked, if she understood the meaning of the town. She said she did. And she also confirmed that the members of the European Parliament, which is the EU Parliament, also understood that it represented Babel from the Bible. And that the purpose of the European Union, listen to this, you need to hear this clear. The purpose of the European Union was to finish what Nimrod and the people together had failed to do so some 3,500 years ago. What was the purpose of, of Nimrod? To unite the entire world in rebellion against God. Mm. Now here these folks have come and have built their own tower of Babel modernized of course and the idea is once again to unite the people of the world and in their union this union is is to be done certainly without god they don't want god in the picture at all all right let's go a little bit further with this although the eu says it is a circular secular state it uses symbols, biblical symbols, that are spirit in the dark. Hmm. But I'm going to show you another one of their symbols. Here is a woman riding a beast, which is found outside in front of the, of the building of the Council of Ministers in Europe. Now look at this picture that's on the screen now. This is a beast. It, it, it's, it's a bull. There's a woman who's riding this beast. All right, this same image is one that is similar on posters and poster stamps in Europe. Now, let me stop here. I want you to look at that. I want you to look at that, that picture that's on the screen now. The woman that's riding the bull. And let's go to Revelation chapter 17. Uh, and I want to read something here that, that uh, will help you out with this. All right, I'm reading from Revelation chapter 17. I meant to print the scriptures, but I didn't. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open your Bibles. Revelation chapter 17. If you don't have a Bible, then be sure you listen as I read this. All right. Here's what it says. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vows, and talked with me. Now, this is John saying this. He said, this angel came and talked with him. Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now listen to verse three, because this is going to relate to the picture here. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and 10 horns. John said in this vision here that he was shown a woman that was riding a beast. And this beast had seven heads and 10 horns. This picture that is on here now uh, over there in Europe that is used uh, uh, that's put on posters and and that's on um, poster stamps. Uh, this symbol comes from the Bible. In particular, 
It comes from Revelation chapter 17. Now, this chapter, it is a what we call a parenthetical chapter. And because you need to know this when you study Revelation, Revelation is not written in chronological order. All right. But parenthetical chapters would give you some information that's not in previous chapters, but God certainly wanted us to have this additional information to know what's going on, particularly with the city of Babylon. Now, let me explain some, some things to you here, and then you, we're going to tie this woman in here, uh, uh, Mystery Babylon, the woman that's riding this, this beast. When the Antichrist first arrives on the scene, and this is what I spoke about uh, the past two Tuesday nights when I was with Pastor John Howard in the St. Mark Church, when the Antichrist first arrives on the scene, he will make a peace treaty with Israel. You can clearly see this in Daniel 9 and 27. Now, I want, I want, I want you to understand something, folks, if this is your first night uh, with this particular subject. Uh, the church right now is looking for the rapture to take place. That's when the saints, dead and alive, and you, and you can read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you also have some scriptures over there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You will find that on the day of the rapture, Jesus is going to stop in midair. And the saints that are dead, they're going to rise up out of the grave. By the time they come out of the grave, uh, they will join those of us who are alive. And John said, together we'll be caught up in there to meet the Lord. He's going to take us back to heaven. All right. Now, when this happens, I don't know how soon it would be after the day of the rapture, but the Antichrist is going to make his appearance. If you get left behind, then you're going to see a mysterious character that's going to rise. Very charismatic, smart, intelligent. He's going to, he's going to become a world leader. And he's going to come up with a plan to solve the Middle East crisis. Now, keep this in mind. What my time is? Okay. Okay. Keep this in mind, every U.S. president, sister Rada, from President uh, Harry Truman up to Joe Biden, Joe Biden has not had an opportunity to work on it yet because of the COVID-19 uh, virus situation. But every president since Harry Truman has tried to work with, has tried to come up with a peace plan to solve the Middle East crisis. Because mm -hmm. Donald Trump was engaged in some things uh, before he left. Joe Biden would, would probably go back to it. But now here's the thing. Nobody has been successful and nobody will be successful. But when the Antichrist arrives on the scene, all of a sudden he's going to come up with a peace plan that seems to going to solve the issue there at, there at Jerusalem between the Muslims and the Jews who are fighting over a piece of land that both of them said is rightfully theirs to build their house of worship. Now, at this particular time, the Antichrist will also become a part of a 10 kingdom confederacy. 10 kings don't come together. They, they're supposedly going to be equal in power. All right. And that means that each king will have control of his country, but they're going to work together for their common good. Listen to this carefully. These 10 United Kings will use the woman riding on a beast. Listen to me carefully. That's the woman that's riding on the beast. Mystery Babylon is what, what the scripture referred to her as. Uh, she's also called the great whore in verse one. She's called Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth in verse five. All right. They will use this woman who's riding on the beast to help unite the people in their country as well as other individuals outside of the country. Who was Mr. Bazin? The woman is symbolic of a religious system, idolatry. <clears throat> All right? Now, I want you to keep these two things in mind as I discuss this next point here. Number one, there is a call today for a one world religion. 
You've heard about it. One world religion. And, and, and because of that, you have an ecumenical movement among the religious uh, system to find common grounds or similarities among the world's religion. Why, why is there a call for one world religion? Ultimately, the idea is to have a one world government. Isn't that what Nimrod wanted? One world government. And notice what Nimrod did. He, he tried his best to pull the attention of the world away from God and introduce idolatry, which led hopefully to the worship of himself. Now we have this call for one, a one world religion because what they are telling us, we will never be able to have a one world government with multiple religions because these different religions are teaching different things. And many times there have been many wars that have been caused because of religious differences. That's what you have going on between the Jews and, and the Palestinians who are Muslims. Okay, I want you to understand that. By the way, I got that statement on here as well. The Roman Catholic Church is among uh, uh, the circles of Christianity. They say that they are the mother church and that all her daughters will come home, will come back home to her one day. What, what do they mean by that? They're saying all these different denominations, Baptist, Methodist, Church of God in Christ, Presbyterian, all of these different groups and in independent churches are one day going to find their way back and will become a part of the mother church again. Mm -hmm. Look at that now. That ideal is really lead to what? The one world government because the Pope today and Pope's past have been in instigated uh, situations to find common ground between uh, the Catholic Church and other religions such as Islam and um, Hinduism and Buddhism, they work to try to connect with these people. Here in America, oh, I, 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 I don't need to add too many things, but here in America, you have a group, I don't know if you've heard this, is right, called Christum, Christum. Christum comes from the terms Christianity and Islam, where the two are trying to merge and say we're the same. And, and let me say this, let me say this, and I want y'all to understand something very clearly, that Christianity and Islam are not the same, all right? The God of heaven, which we teach, is a triune God, all right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is different from the uh, Islamic God that they refer to as Allah. Allah is really a uh, moon god. If you check the history, that was very bloody. They believe in violence. All right. That, so I'm, I'm trying to show you how this thing is shaped together. Number two, the future 10 kingdom confederation. Now, talk about those 10 kings. One of them is the Antichrist himself, will be located in an area that, that, that is either already heavily dominated by Islam or where Islam is, is advancing at an alarming rate. Because that 10 kingdom confederation that eventually is going to come under control on the one man, and that's the Antichrist, that confederation is going to be within what theologians term as the old Roman Empire, which is southern and most of Europe, the Middle East, like with Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, uh, Iraq, Saudi Arabia. And then if you go back to the West, you, you'll be going into Northern Africa, Egypt, Libya, Morocco. All of that territory is where this 10 kingdom is going to emerge, which, which, which denotes the fact there's going to be some wars in order to, to get this narrowed down to, to 10 kingdoms. Now, the area I just described, Northern Africa is Muslim. All of the Middle East except Israel is Muslim. Now, that leaves Southern Europe or, or the continent of Europe that's not completely dominated by Muslims, but Muslims are moving into France and to Italy, Great Britain, countries that, that uh, 
you know, you never would have thought about becoming an Islamic country. They're moving them. They're in large numbers. They're asking for their rights. They have taken over many of the European cities, have taken over. Maybe not your larger cities, but some of the smaller ones. And they're advancing at a very large uh, rate, and they're getting the laws changed that would benefit Islam. Go do the research. It's bad. Now, notice we read in the scripture that this woman, this, this woman who symbolizes a religious system, rides a beast that has what? Seven heads and ten horns. Here's the artist's conception of, of this. You got a woman here. All right. She got a gold cup in her hand. And that's that's in scripture. And you, it, I think if you count the heads here, you're going you're gonna to have seven heads here. And, and you, if you count the horns, there are ten horns here. All right. Let's look at some other scriptures here. Verse 18 of, of Revelation 17 said, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of earth. Now, remember, the woman is a religious system. Of course, it's, it's a, she's associated with the city of Babylon, mystery Babylon. If we go back to Nimrod, what did Nimrod do? Nimrod got the folks to, to turn their backs on God, and, and, and he gets them to do what? Start worshiping idol gods, which led to the worship of himself, hopefully, but in the, in the religions that they had, even back then with Nimrod and those that would carry on after Nimrod died, they had many secrets and many mysteries, many hidden things. Now, if you look at the way of salvation when it comes to God, which comes through Jesus Christ, there is nothing that is hidden. The gospel is plain. If a man would simply repent of his sins, and, and come to Jesus and allow him to become Lord, he is accepted into the family of a God. And then we learn of his ways that are not mysterious, but we learn through scriptures, through sermon, through Bible study. Nothing is, is, is going to be kept back for a person to want to learn. But in these mysterious religions, there are some things that are going to be held back where there's only a elite few will have the secrets. Everybody won't have the secrets and a lot of mysterious things. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to get you to see where this name, even Mr. Dallin, comes from. Now, uh, so this woman, this this woman, a religious system will have control. What the scripture says is, let me go back to verse 18, the woman which y'all saw is, the, is that great city which reigned over the kings of the earth. This woman is a religious system that we have control over the leaders of these, that, that's a misprint, should be kingdoms rather than kings. Over the leaders, the, the leaders are the king. The leadership of entire nations. And, and I want you to look at something I'm trying to say here, I'm trying to give you uh, uh, an example in the next sense. The leadership of entire nations at times has been, at, at times have been controlled by religion, for example. If you look at the country of Iran today, the president of this country must comply and obey the supreme leader who is the religious authority. The president of Iran cannot make a decision that goes against what the supreme leader who has who was not elected, he cannot go against him. This is to show you how easily it be for Mr. Babylon to come in here because this religious system as such will control the political leaders. Verse 2 tells us that the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. It has been said that the doing of religion is the most powerful narcotic there is. What do we mean by that? People tend to follow their religion and the spirit of false religion is very, very powerful. Drunk with the wine of her fornication doesn't speak of, you know, literal alcohol or immorality, but these are words used as metaphors to explain a spiritual condition which showed that 
that people will be drunk and cannot see what this religious system is all about. They'll be blind to the fact that it will lead to their downfall, their detriment. Look at what verse 16 says. We, we give it to come to the end here. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Remember this woman riding on the beast. And this woman appears when? At the beginning of the tribulation period. Okay. She's going to rise up. But the Antichrist is also going to rise up. He's a member of the Ten Kingdom Federation. The Ten Horns on that picture that we saw earlier represent the Ten Kingdom Confederation. All right. Uh, somewhere during the, the first three, three and a half years of the tribulation, don't miss this point here. The Antichrist is going to start fighting. Remember, he's one of the Ten Kings. He's going to start fighting the other king. And he's going to defeat three of the kings. Don't defeat them, going to defeat them fairly quickly. You can see that in Daniel 7 and 8, and also verses 24 and 25 in the chapter. Okay. Because when you read those verses over in Daniel, the Antichrist is symbolized by a little horn. And that little horn, Daniel said he saw him come up and three horns were plucked out. That means he defeated three of those kings that's in that 10 kingdom confederation. Now, once he defeats those three kings, the other six kings are going to say we are no match for him. And they're just going to give their power over to the Antichrist. Now, guess what's going to happen then? The Antichrist will no longer, along with his comrades of, of this new uh, kingdom that he's going to form out of these ten kings, he will no longer need the woman. They will destroy her. The Antichrist would demand beast worship, which would be a worship of him. Now, let me go back to help you to understand something here. You see, in the beginning, the woman who that's a religious system, she's riding on the beast. The beast is the, are those 10 heads that represent those 10 kings. All right. The, the 10 kings at first, along with the Antichrist, they are need, they are need the woman or the religious system to control the people to get the folks to come to them. But once the Antichrist gets the power he desires to have in that 10 kingdom confederation where he has total control, he no longer needs the woman. Mm -hmm. Don't need it anymore. That's why this verse tells you, and the 10 horns without saws upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh, burn her with fire. They will destroy her. They will destroy her. They will get rid of that religious system. That, that doesn't mean they're going to get rid of religion, because at this point, the Antichrist false prophet is going to take control over his religious matters, matters to get the world, hopefully, to worship the Antichrist. See, we don't really know just all aspects of the of, of Mr. Babylon. I do think there are two groups that will be highly involved in this. The Islamic faith is probably going to be involved in this because they are, you know, they, they are very, very dogmatic when it comes to you being a part of religion. Those that are, are violent, they tell you you either join us or you be killed. And, and 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 so in many countries they force people to join the Muslim faith. And, but the one thing about them as Muslims, they believe in worshiping Allah and no other gods. They don't believe in worshiping man. But what's going to happen, people, when the Antichrist gets very powerful, and I do believe Islam is going to be a big part of this. He very well may use Islam to gain more control because they are already, once again, a dogmatic by people following the, the details of their religion, following the Quran. Once he gets where he, he wants to be, he no longer would need them. So he gets rid of the woman. He gets rid of the religious system and replaces it with beast worship. 
And the idea of this, when that happened, this is when the mark of the beast come in, 666. Revelation chapter 13, read the last three verses, will tell you, except the person has this, this mark in their forehead, forehead or in their hand, you cannot buy or sell goods. The Antichrist is going to try to force the whole world. He wants the whole world to follow him. So he's going to take over uh, much of the economic systems of the world. Now, he's not going to get control of everything, but he's going to make an attempt. He's going to have influence over the entire world. He's going to try to make it mandatory that you either worship me or you die. That's why he's going to come up with the mark of the beast. Because what is he trying to do? He ultimately wants to rule the entire world. I hope y'all see from this lesson what I'm trying to tell you. I talked about the European Union, what they're doing. Look at the symbols. The symbols going to are, are depicting Babylon, mystery Babylon. All right, but but the European Union is not the only group. You got all these other secret societies like the Triliteral. Commission, the Bilderberg Group. These are secret societies with very, very wealthy and elite people who are all saying that we need a one world government. Listen, you, you have these individuals now who are, uh, because of the COVID-19 virus, they are saying that we must have a reset, that we're gonna have to reset our economy, our governments, where the, whether these governments can work together to never allow another pandemic uh, to cause the havoc that is caused in this world. Now, it's good if you're going to try to stop a pandemic, but they want to stop problems and pandemics without going to God. Same thing Nimrod did, if you, if you really understand what I'm trying to show you here tonight. So all of this is coming together. It's coming together. And let, I'm getting ready to close. Because uh, I may have bored some of y'all patients. I hope you're getting something out of this. But I want you to look at what's going on in the world. And I got a question on the screen right now that said, Can't you see what is happening in our world today? Because in America, there's a call to be politically correct. The Christian church is not supposed to preach against other religions. And if we do, then the church is going to be punished. This is what they're saying, all right? And of course, this is why more and more laws or legislation uh, is being passed right now to silence the church. They do not want us to preach against these different lifestyles. You know what I'm talking about. They do not want us to preach against some other thing. And while they are trying to silence the church, Islam is yet being allowed to practice its belief without any reservations. They don't bother Muslims. Right now in your school system, public school system, they do not want you to teach about Christianity. You can teach about Christianity in a historical manner. I know what I'm saying because I'm a retired history teacher. You could teach it in a historical manner well, you are not trying to cause anybody to come to your church. But they don't want you to do that. But they will allow the Muslims to teach about, uh, about their ways, about the founder of their religion, Mohammed. He will allow you to institute uh, certain facets of that religion in your classroom. It dress uh, like the Muslims are old. Read the Quran. Recite the Quran. You try to recite the Bible in your classroom, you're going to have some trouble in, in many cases. The Muslims today are saying that they're going to control America one day without a war at all because they believe that they'll use our own laws with all the freedoms we enjoy to turn this nation toward Islam. On the other hand, there's a move towards socialism in this country. And and I want you to know, not only this country, but the entire world, and this is also anti-church. You see, in order to have a one world government, I, I said it earlier about, about religion, your religious rights must be taken away as well as other rights. The borders must be completely open to merge the different cultures 
and money must be equally distributed with only a few people in control. Now, what y'all think about what's going on in this particular country? We keep having problems with our borders. Now, I'm not against certainly helping people who are coming from uh, south of the border. They need help. I certainly disagree with uh, President Trump, who called them rapists and murderers and all that kind of stuff. But if you're going to have a nation, you got to have laws. If you're going to have a nation, you got to control your borders. You got to have certain things in place uh, to keep terrorists and other folk from coming into your country. And so we, we need to readdress the situation now. And look at what is happening because some of this is if you if, if you get a lot of folks to come in with different cultures and intermingle and everything, get all these different cultures, different ideas, they know it's gonna to lead to a breakdown of society. If you have a breakdown of society, then guess what you're gonna to have to do? Somebody is gonna to have to become a dictator. Mm -hmm. That's what they that's what some people are hoping will happen. Get all these folks mixing in together and and and, and just let some problems you emerge and then we're going to have to go to martial law. And for martial law, we're going to have to do some other things. We may have to interrupt the election process and might have to change uh, how you vote and take away some of those rights. You got to look at that. A lot of things are happening now. One last note here I want to say, there's also a belief that the world's population is too large, which means a large number of people must be eliminated. We have about 7 billion folks in the world they say you only need about four billion. And so they mean somebody got to die. All of this is, is, is said because they are trying to take us to a one world government one day. And if I had time and maybe down the line, I could do this lesson again in a different manner and show you some top notch, top name folks in this world who have made statements, you know, that you may not have paid attention, but these statements are public that they're saying that we've got to have a one world government in order that the world survive. But keep this in mind, they don't want God a part of the government. All right. So here's the idea, and I'm getting ready to close. The idea is I'm in this lesson, I tried to show you as much as possible some things that are happening presently that's going to make it easier. For the Antichrist to emerge. Everything is already set in place. The world is chaotic. All right. So people are hungry for something different. People are waiting on a leader who will solve all of our issues. President Obama was elected a few years ago. And what did people like about him? He's charismatic, good speaker, smart, intelligent. President Obama could not win. If, on, if, 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 if it was just the votes of black people, because we only make up 12% of the population. President Obama had to have had the white vote in order to become president. A lot of white people wanted change. And that's what he promised. And people believe that because of his ability. The Antichrist is going to be more charismatic than President Obama. And so if we if people, if you got certain people that create chaos, and some people are trying to create chaos in this world. If that occurs, that makes it easier for a dictator to come in like the dictator who's going to come up with some solutions, particularly the thing that's going to solve the Middle East crisis. But not only the Middle East crisis, but other problems around the world. He emerges and he's going to try his best to take us to a one world government. And in order to have a one world government, you got to have a one world religion in order for that to happen. And he's going to use Mr. Babylon symbolized by the woman riding the beast to achieve his, his goal. Last statement of heaven, the Lord is soon to come because we can see it right before our eyes, what's going on that depicts that we are living in the last day. I want to say this because my time is out. Folks, it's time to be real for the Lord. It is time to wholeheartedly follow the Lord Jesus. With all our heart, our soul, our might. We've had a hard time this last year and coming into 2021. They think the pandemic 
is, is, is coming to an end, hopefully, and I hope it does, but we don't really know what's on the horizon. Something else may break forward because people are yet going in their own direction and are looking for solutions without God. That's what will make it possible for the Antichrist to come in because people want a solution, but they don't want God. I'm going to do something a little different tonight. I hope this lesson has stirred you. If you're not saved, if you don't know the Lord in the pardon of your sins, it is time that you come to Christ. The Lord Jesus is coming again. He's coming. Will you be ready when he comes? Because the stuff that I just talk, talked in this lesson is going to happen after the rapture of the church, after the saints are taken out of this world, the church is taken out of this world. And you don't want to be left behind for all this confusion that is going to erupt, that's going to be much worse than what we're facing today. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, why don't you just pray this simple prayer to me by just simply saying, Lord Jesus, I come to you now because I realize that I am a sinner that I don't have a right relationship with you. Lord Jesus, I don't want to be left behind and have to face this world of chaos that's coming later and have to face the wrath of God and ultimately go to a burning hell. I'm asking you, Lord, to forgive me of all of my sins. I am sorry for what I've done. Forgive me, Lord. Wash me in your blood and save me now. Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer. And with your help, I'm going to do right. Amen. If you prayed that simple prayer and meant in your heart, God has forgiven you of your sins. It's not a hard thing to do. Now you need to be taught. You need to grow. So I encourage you to certainly be united with a Bible teaching church. Yes, so that you can experience growth. And we certainly will welcome you as a part of Little the Valley. We'd be glad to have you to come. You can even uh, be a member through these electronic means if you don't live in Greenville. Through the electronic church, we'd be happy to have you. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord say the same. Uh, Sunday, we'll be back for Sunday school, 9 o'clock. Our worship services, 1030 on Sunday. And uh, we certainly like to have you to join us again on Sunday. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. Let's say good night.